Tales from Mortimer Poe. Mortimer Poe, the half-dead raven, is a distant cousin to Hunan and Munin, the ravens that bring tales of the world to Odin. But Mortimer, born outside the window of Edgar Allan Poe, only brings tales of worlds that aren't real to the ears of those who want to explore alternate realms of possibility. Today, Mortimer brings you the tale of Fumits to the End of Time. <coughs> Horns roared, the blast loud enough to ripple the pool at the sewage treatment plant. That's not the tornado siren, I thought, looking out the window of my office. It's not so loud, especially this far out. It didn't sound like the French horns and tubas from the orchestra, either. There were no metallic echoes underneath the blast of sound. As I looked out the window of my office, thunderous thumps turned the ripples into chaotic waves. It sounded like... Hooves? I ran outside. Four men riding the biggest horses I'd ever seen galloped toward the plant. At first, all I could really make out were the horses which seemed to grow bigger the closer they came. The thumping of their hooves pounded into my chest as the waves in the pools got so big they almost sloshed onto the concrete. I thought they would just ride on past, since a six-foot chain-link fence surrounded the plant area. But as they got closer, the leader jerked his reins back with both hands and his huge black horse leapt the fence. I scrambled backwards as the animal crashed to the concrete. Three more crashes followed, and the smell of raw sewage made me cover my nose. They must have churned up the pool but good if even I couldn't take the smell, because I worked here. But the riders didn't seem to notice, which was downright odd. The trail is weak, the leader said. We need to find it. His clothes came straight out of a barbarian movie, made mostly of heavy leather with a bit of fur around the neck. A metal helmet coned around his head, almost like a Viking one without the horn sticking out the sides. Instead, a horn hung across his chest, curving from hip to shoulder, tied with a thong at each end. Yes, my lord, the rest of the riders replied. They didn't look nothing like their leader. The one closest to me wore a conservative business suit, smudges of dust streaking the expensive-looking black fabric. The white shirt underneath was grubby and gray, like he hadn't changed it in a while. Wingtip shoes jutted through his stirrups. The one next to him had on bright yellow spandex biker shorts, the kind that go down to just above the knee, with a matching t-shirt hugging his chest. The man's heavily muscled thighs clenched against his horse as it clacked its hooves on the pavement. I hoped that outfit was tougher than it looked, or he was going to get his thighs torn up on that saddle muscles or no. The last guy looked like a hell's angel, with beat-up chaps strapped over a faded pair of jeans. A studded black leather jacket covered a t-shirt fading from black to some rusty brown color around the collar. He held the reins with one hand on either side of the horse, more like he was holding handlebars than a live animal. This is a restricted area. I stepped closer to the leader, trying to sound all official and imposing, but it was hard when all I could see was the horse's nose next to my face. This ain't exactly public property, even if we are owned by the county. Can I ask who y'all are? We are the hunt. I stepped back from the horse so I could look up at the leader. Hunters, where are your guns? He laughed his loud voice bouncing off the cinder-block wall behind me. Guns will not help us against our prey. I didn't get that, since guns worked against just about any kind of animal I knew of. Didn't make no sense to argue with them about it, and if they didn't have guns, it was better for me if I had to throw them off the property. If you say so, I muttered, you still aren't supposed to be here. The leader looked to the wingtip man. I am amused, guns. Is there any sign of our prey? He gestured with a flip of his fingers. The guy swung his leg over the massive beast and dropped to the concrete. 
His wingtips clacked as he strode to the edge of the now stagnant sewage pool. I started to protest, but decided to keep quiet when the leader's hand shifted close to his sword. No gun didn't mean no weapon, apparently. Wingtip man knelt, getting his face dangerously close to the water, taking big sniffs. Lord, I cannot tell. There is too much debris here disguising the signs. You shouldn't get so close to the raw sewage, I told him. Stuff will make you sick if you get it on you. You looking for something in particular? If you lost it down a drain, it's not going to be in the pool. Wingtip man looked back over his shoulder at me, but before he said something, I saw his eyes focus behind me. I turned around to see the leader had turned his full attention on me. And why do you say that? Despite the mild tone, I knew he wasn't asking just for the sake of asking. He expected an answer, one that wasn't a waste of his time. Drain traps usually catch anything that falls through, and we filter out the larger debris before it gets here to remove anything that isn't organic. The leader looked beyond me to Wingtip Man. Organic. Wingtip Man smiled. Stuff that came from a living thing? As it happens, he said to me, what we're looking for is organic. I shook my head and walked over to the side of the building, unhooking my dipping rod for taking pool samples. Let me get you a bit to sniff in the cup here, if that's what takes your fancy, so you don't fall in and catch something. Wingtip man nodded. I stirred the cup around a couple of times to get a good sample, then heaved it out and rested it on the concrete, well away from the pool's edge. Wingtip man squatted down and took a deep sniff without so much as wrinkling his nose. He looked back at the leader. They've been this way, but it's hard to say when with all the other scents mixed in. The man held up the dipping rod for the leader. He stared at it a long moment before waving it away. Wingtip man handed the dipping rod back to me. We continue south, the leader announced. We'll look for the trail at the next one of... He waved his hand at the treatment plant. These we encounter. If you're going south, I found myself saying, the next one isn't for 50 miles. We got a good piping system hereabouts because folks don't like the smell. The leader looked at me in that uncomfortable way again. The dipping rod slipped spilling a few drops on the concrete. I leaned over and set it down, fussing with it to keep the sludge inside the cup before I let it go. I stood back up. He was still staring at me. You are very knowledgeable about these sewage treatment plants? I know a fair bit. You know about organic? Uh... Sort of. I worked here for fifteen years. The leader flicked his fingers again, and Wingtip Man came over to him. Yes, Lord Odin? Do we have a spare horse? Wingtip Man looked at the rider in the biker shorts. The man stood in his stirrups and closed his eyes. He pointed off to the west. My lord, there's a suitable horse a short distance from here. Lord Odin looked down at me. Join the hunt, he invited. Huntmaster, you can take him to collect the fumets. Oh, yes, agreed Wingtip Man. He does seem well suited for the task. The rest of the riders nodded as their horses began shifting nervously. Their excitement made the air feel heavy around me. I walked over to Wingtip Man and motioned for him to turn away from the leader. Lord, whatever. Huntmaster, can I ask, with all, all the other guys knowing, what's a fumit? Ah, the Huntmaster said. A fumit is, well, he said, his eyes falling to the sewage pool, a present along the trail from your prey. 
present. That don't make no kind of sense. The kind of present you have to avoid stepping in? I drew in a long breath. Oh, and the Lord over there wants for you to collect them for him. The huntmaster shrugged his shoulders. They can tell a trained hunter quite a bit about the condition of his prey and how long it's been since he passed through. Our prey is particularly clever about avoiding us, but he can't... Well, everyone has to. Everyone has to, all right, I said. Don't I know it? I turned back around to look at Lord Odin. I'd love to join you guys, but I really can't leave work right now. Thanks kindly for the offer. Lord Odin glared down at me, a cruel crinkle to his lips that couldn't by any rights be called a smile. Are you refusing to join the hunt? The horses behind Lord Odin snorted and stomped their hooves, as if they were as disturbed by his tone as I was. My lord, the huntmaster interjected, I'm sure he intends to accept your offer. He motioned me close again. I looked uneasily at Lord Odin, then leaned in. You can't refuse, the huntmaster told me. No, what I can't do is leave work. I'll lose my job. There are worse things. What would be worse than losing my job? If you refuse... We will hunt you. The huntmaster climbed up onto his horse. When he was settled, he held out a hand to me. I looked up at it. I figured I should be thinking something, but instead I focused on the lines of the huntmaster's hand. They must have been soft once, a guy wearing a suit like that, but holding the reins had roughened them up and deepened the creases in his palms. Wasn't one of those called a lifeline by the carnival palm readers? I didn't hold with heathen nonsense normally, but right now it seemed there was some kind of message in that. If you aren't coming, the huntmaster said after a long moment, maybe Lord Odin will give you a head start. I caught my breath, reached out, and grabbed the huntmaster's hand. He hauled me up until I was able to scramble onto the horse behind him. The huntmaster snapped his fingers at the man in the biker shorts and pointed. Biker shorts man pulled his horse around and leapt the fence. Hell's Angel man followed, then Lord Odin. I felt the power of the horse under me as the huntmaster urged it forward. It took a couple of steps and pushed, easily propelling us over the chain link security fence. Coming down, I was weightless for a moment before slamming against the saddle. The horse galloped after the hunters, bringing us easily alongside Lord Odin. "'How long are we going to be hunting for?' I heard my own voice ask, surprised at my eagerness. Odin laughed. "'The great hunt ends with the world!' <coughs> Mortimer's story, Fumets to the End of Time was written by Erica Kaler. Mortimer's narrator for this tale was Erica Kaler. Sound effects were sourced from freesoundlibrary.com. <laughs>